Number one, you should be honest. Okay, you should not worry about if I say this, is he gonna get fired? I'm not gonna get fired. Okay? So, you should be honest. Uh, should I say this? Sounds too bad, sounds too good. I, I don't really want to be that nice. Don't worry about that. Say whatever you like, good or bad thing. Okay? Number one. Two, it's better to be constructive. If you say, I really didn't like the way he dresses up. Hey, ain't not much to do about that, right? You should really think, uh, if my friends take this course next year with Virgil, how should this course improve, right? And I've got a lot of comments in this course that were saying, uh, meter is too hard, right? Homeworks are too many. That's not something I'm gonna change. You could say that, and you could even argue it from a quantitative point of view. Look, if I'm to do those homeworks and the meter and all that, it will take me 25 hours a week and I don't have enough time for other things. Even though I'm still not gonna change it. <laughs> this is a general complaint about this class, why it takes so much effort to, to get it right. Uh, the reason that is, while I agree it takes more effort than other classes perhaps, is that this is absolutely fundamental in the way the world, the way industry and, and uh, interviews and recruiting works. If you, if you can't solve problems, as in problem solving, I'm not talking about proofs, I'm talking about problem solving, you're not gonna be competitive for what you wanna do next. Whether that's a PhD or a job, it doesn't matter. So I have to calibrate the class to the level that's useful for you, whether that's hard or easy, okay? So please do those trace evaluations. I'm gonna ask about it again next week, of course. Um, it's nice if there are many of you doing it, because there's a percentage recorded how many people out of a class of 60 did the trace evaluations. So independent of what you're saying, good or bad, um, I, I would like you guys to do it. And if you additionally want to send me some comment that does, you feel it doesn't fit in those trace evaluations, either personally or, uh, uh, you know, and you mostly like find a, a web server to send me an email, you know, like from, from somebody in your class, you know, that's fine. Please do so, I appreciate those things. You should know that even if you don't send it, and, uh, you know, like if you send it with your email address, your grade in no way will depend on what you say. Even if you are offensive with your comments, I'm still not gonna put your grade depending on what you say, okay? Your grade will purely come from homework and exams. No matter what you say, even if it's illegal or immoral or whatever, it's not going to affect your grade. That being said, we kind of done with the stuff that we need to do. The basic stuff that's absolutely required for you guys to know. Short post pass, dynamic programming, you know, amortized analysis, quick source, sort of things like that. My, my main priority in this class is to make sure that when you get out of it, you, you don't stumble on something that you definitely should know. Like if somebody else asks you later on, okay, how's quick support? You say, I don't know, that, that's a big problem, right? So we kind of done with that. Uh, there's one more thing that's required in homeworks and the exam, which we're gonna do today, but it's not really essential for algorithms. It's not like everybody's gonna have to know this and have to use this, like with graphs. With graphs, you absolutely have to know strongly connected components or network flows. Those are mandatory things. What I'm gonna talk about today, linear programming. Actually, we gonna, I, I hope I get to uh, also talk about integer programming. It's very, very important if you need it. But not everyone will need linear programs. Okay. But uh, we have a homework about it, and it might happen in the exam. I think in 10 years I had one exam that had one question that could have been done with linear programming or with a different method. Okay? So I'm not saying it's impossible to get a question about linear programs in the exam. I'm saying it's unlikely, statistically looking at what happened in the previous 10 years. Okay. Okay. So before we do this, we need to establish some basic things um, about soccer balls. 
You guys know how a soccer ball looks like? No. No? A ball like uh, I, I'm using a soccer ball to make your 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 intuition about it. Of course, we're not really gonna have a soccer ball in there. But uh, imagine this. I think there's like uh, pentagons in a soccer ball, right? And then there's the sides. Right? I'm gonna try to draw a ball here. <laughs> like those are the sides of the ball. Two, three, four. Or hexagons doesn't matter what they are. So, some of them. I'm, I'm doing. I'm doing a soccer ball. So this is kind of the top of the ball, and as you go down the ball, the ball becomes more round, right? So what I'm trying to describe is an object that looks like a ball, except all faces are flat and all edges are straight. He said, take a, a real ball, like something very nice and round, and now chop off like with, with a knife faces of it, right? So if I do that, what's gonna happen? Every face is gonna be perfectly flat and every edge is gonna be perfectly straight. An edge, I mean something with two faces, right? So uh, objects, simple objects like this are, are something that I'm sure you guys have seen. Is a tetraedra, right? The simplest object in 3D that has this property is if I cut how many cuts I have here, how many faces I have. Four faces, right? How many edges I have? One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, this is too simple for what I need. I'm looking for ones that have more chops. Imagine if I chop the top now. I say, okay, chop it off. What's going to happen at the top? If I chop it off, I'm going to end up with something like, depending how I chop it off, something like this, right? And now suppose I chop off this corner here. Take a knife and cut it up. What's going to happen? I'm going to get something like this, right? Mm -hmm. Now, suppose I cut the bottom. So I can keep doing this, right? Chop this part here. And I get more faces to this object. The more I cut, every, every cut creates a new face, right? I want you guys to have this intuition of such a, such a thing. And my intuition is related to a soccer ball because if you look at the, the way it's made, it has those little like rope cutting in, if you were a basket. Basketball balls are different, but the soccer balls usually have pentagon or hexagons. They're not really flat, but assuming they're flat, you can clearly see the edges on those balls. The, the originally, a few years ago, all balls were white and black, if you remember. And the black ones were pentagons and the white ones were hexagons. But now, of course, with advertisement, the balls are not white and black anymore. There's like Coca-Cola on them and whatever. Anyway, I, I need you guys to have this in mind when we talk about this. So the, the property of those things is that inside looks like a ball. We do not have big concavities inside, right? So it still looks like a, the, the general property of co convexity that we, we don't want to talk about it today formally, um, is that if an object like this, let's call this object, in uh, it's convex, this object uh, includes interior, including the interior. So I'm not talking just the surface. I'm talking about the ball, the surface, and all the points that are inside. Convexity means if x, two points, x and y, belongs to the object, then uh, x plus y by two also belongs to the object. And in more general sense, any combination, linear combination, alpha x plus one minus alpha y, also belongs to the object. So in, in, a, in my object here, what it says, if you have two points interior, an x and a y, all this segment between x and y 
that is the segment. If this is the segment, a segment algebraic can be written with, you know, all the possibilities of combining x and y, right? Like the middle, it's of course the middle, that's x plus y by 2. If I want to go closer to x, I make this alpha close to 1. That's x plus 0, so that's close to x. And if I want to get close to y, I make alpha close to 0. So alpha is a kind of a controller on this line where you want to be. So this is a convexity property that says if you get two points inside the object, a convex object, the, all the line, the whole segment has to be included. Right? So in 2D, a triangle is a convex object, right? Because any two points you pick in the triangle, the segment is in. But in 2D, if I draw this thing, that's not convex. Because I can pick a point here and a point here, and the line is not inside. So, so far we need two properties. One is that there are those objects, uh, and it's easy to see them in 3D because we, we, we have perception in 3D, human perception. Not so easy to visualize them in 4D or 5D or 6D. But algebraically, these equations work in any number of dimensions. X could be, in here X is a three-dimensional point, but I could have a six-dimensional point, and the algebra would work just the same. Which is harder to see in six dimensions. So I have the notion of convexity, and I I don't use the convexity. I need this kind of argument, but the objects I'm going to look for are going to be always polyedras, like flat edges and flat. So polyedras, flat edges. flat faces, um, sharp vertices, and continuous or convex interior. So this is a correct object in 2D. This is also a correct object in 2D, right? Because it has sharp faces, sharp edges. Uh, and a continuous convex interior. This is not because it's not convex. I could have a convex object that has some circles around, right? This, this is a side and this is a round. This is also convex, right? Any two points have the segment interior. But it's not the object I'm looking for because it has a round face. I'm looking for objects that have sharp faces and sharp edges. So number one property, this kind of polyedras. Number two, convexity. That says the, the, the interior of it has to be convex. It doesn't have any cuts inside, like this object here. And number three is um, if I really look at an object like this, I'm going to draw something. I don't know how well I'm going to do on that. Now imagine this is in 3D, right? Suppose I have a height function. So I measure, this is literally a 3D object, right? And uh, I put this object in space, in the physical space, like imagine I have it right here. I could define the height function being the z coordinate, like the one that's you know, aligned with the gravity axis of the planet, right? Height, like the regular height. And now every vertex has some height, right? Every cope taken from the floor or from the sea level or something. Assuming I'm not rotating the object, I'm keeping it fixed, every vertex will have some height. So there'll be a height here, a height here, height here, a height here, a height here. Every um, this is polydirectional. 
So the notion of height, even though I, this object is in 2D or 3D or 6D, there's one line that detects that detect the height. So you, you really should think of it as the whatever dimensions the object has, I'm measuring from the floor how high each vertex is in that height. Okay. And that, that height is really a one-dimensional line, even though the space has many dimensions. So in 3D, you can put the object initially whichever way you want, and that's fixed now. And I can measure the height corresponding to say I have a base plane, that's my base plane, and then measure height from that plane. You can easily see that every vertex will be at some height. Geometrically, that's the projection, the perpendicular on that line, right, of the point. But it, it doesn't matter the geometry here. I have a height. So here's the essential property that we need to, to work with today. I want to get to the point that has the highest height. Okay. There, there is one point to the highest height, right? I have so many vertices on this polyedra, and each of them has a height. The heights are real numbers, right? From maybe zero to max. There is one vertex here that has the maximum height. So I want to get there, and I have an intuition for how I can get there. The intuition is that wherever I am, suppose I'm in here, I'm looking at the really physical model. I have this polyedra and I can walk on it, on the surface. In fact, I would like to only walk on the edges. So I'm in this vertex here. Here's my claim. That's a critical part of the lecture today. If I continue going higher, like I know the height I'm in right now, and I move to a vertex that has a higher height. I'm going up. Eventually, if I keep doing that, I'm going to reach the highest vertex. So imagine that ball, right? It has all kinds of faces and vertices. Those are not necessarily nice regular pentagon or hexagon. It's any vertex, like in here, any, any faces. I'm saying, whatever you are, any vertex in here, if you keep going higher in any direction, just, just increase the height. You, you can go from here, you can go here, you can go here, you can go there, so on and so forth. It doesn't matter. As long as you always increase the height, you're not going to miss the top height. Eventually, you're going to get there. You guys buying this? I don't want to deal with math. As far as I, I, I'm trying as much as I can to not have math now. I'm just saying. I have this convex nice surface, and I, I have a height, so every vertex has a height. The thing's not moving, so that's fixed. And I'm trying to walk among those vertices in that polyedra with the condition I'm always going higher. I'm saying eventually I'm gonna reach that higher point. So this is kind of like in greedy algorithms, right? If I always say I'm in a point, and I have three options from here, go here, or go here, or go here, right? If I always pick the one that goes the highest, because I can say, okay, this height is one, this is also one, this is a two, and this is a two. I could go to height two. My claim is that if you move to a higher height, you can still reach the top. Like in greedy algorithms, right? We make a greedy choice, and we say that greedy choice can still get me to an optimal solution. In this case, optimal means reaching the top. So the real property that I'm putting up here is that if you keep going higher, you, number one, always going to have a route to the top. That's always true. In a convex polyedra, there is a route from everywhere to everywhere. So at no point I'm going to be like, now I'm stuck. There is no way to go up. But I want to say even further, I'm always going to have a route from anywhere to go to the highest point and that route always goes up. So from anywhere to the top, there is always a path that goes that never goes down. Goal is always up. Is that true? Yes, yes. Is it possible that from a point I can only go down? There's no route up? Huh? Only from the highest point if I reach the top. But if I don't reach the top, so suppose I'm in here, right? This is not the top. 
I cut to the plane at that height, perpendicular. <coughs> I cut, I cut this this whole podiedra with a knife at that level of the vertex. And I'm saying from here, why there must be an edge that goes up a little bit. If if I'm cutting it here and there's something up, this being convex, there's this this point where I am. If I cut it right here. If there's no edge going up, this point is not connected. I must have been in a concavity. For example, I could have something like this. See, if I cut it here, I mean this point. This is true, there is no way to go up from here, right? You have to go down, because look, there's only two possibilities. They both go down. Why is this not a situation I'm going to encounter in my polyethra? Because this is only if I have a concavity inside. That's the only way to have this option. If there is no concavity, wherever I am, I'm on a surface on the soccer ball, right? Anywhere you put me, there is a way, a path to the edges that ends up to the highest point. This is the essential property, intuition, that we're going to need today. So I have this polyedra, and in some math classes for undergrads, we actually bring a little object and we, we look at the paths on it, but I think you guys can visualize this without a physical object. There's always this guarantee that not only there is a path that goes up, but if I move up, I'm always going to have that path. I just keep moving up, I'm not going to miss the top. Some people find it easier to see with a mountain. Mountain is not exactly this polyedra. It's more like a, like a tetraedra, right? <laughs> but that says on a mountain, if I'm on a mountain, there is a top of the mountain, right? So that's a single peak point. It says if you go up, it doesn't matter which direction you go up, eventually you're going to reach the top of the mountain. Is that true? Assuming there's no concavities in the mountain, like everywhere, mountain has many trails and you can hike up in any direction you want. You can't just keep going up and not reach the top. If that happens, <coughs> if you keep going up and not reach the top, there must be something like this when you reach this point. That's the local top. It's not the top of the mountain. The reason in here doesn't look like you can go anywhere, you're stuck. It's because this is a concavity in the mountain. There's two mountains here. Assuming we don't have such a thing on a mountain, just keep going up, you're going to reach the top. That's what's happening here. So uh, now, of course, how do we actually manage this? That's the intuition, but how do we actually manage it will have to do with mathematics and algorithms. So let's, um, let's do that. But this is the essential part. If you, if you understand this, then the, the actual procedural stuff is easy. So what I just described, it's called the simplex algorithm. This idea of walking through the vertices, the edges of this, this polyedra, so-called simplex, that's convex and has sharp edges, faces, this idea that reaches the top, it's called the simplex algorithm. It's true that it's applied to other simplexes too, like probability simplexes, for example, which don't look like that. But the, the thing that you need for today is to say, how do I, I mean, some point in a vertex, how do I move up? Okay? And that's essentially is a very simple algorithm. It's going to say, like on a mountain, just go wherever it goes higher. From this point, look where you can go. You can go here, you can go here, you can go here. If you keep going higher, you're going to reach the top. That's the simplex algorithm. Easy, right? Um,
Okay, so what is linear programming? Because I didn't tell you what the linear program means. I'm just going to tell you that if I have such a polyedra or a mountain that's convex and has nice sharp edges and faces, I can walk from any vertex by looking at the edges all the way to the top. That is the highest vertex. Height is a predefined function that's unidimensional in some direction. Okay. The height could be this way, but if you really want to rotate the polyedra, maybe you define the height that way. <coughs> And then says you go as far as possible in that direction. So, but then, how? Wh wh why is this a procedure? Like, here's the setup for why we need this. Linear <coughs> program looks like this. I have a optimization problem. Like, I want the maximum of this, and subject to some constraints. In general, this is called constraint optimization, and I can use it with derivatives, Lagrangian multipliers, whatever, whatever. But these are very particular type of objective and constraints. Both are linear. What does linear mean? What does it mean this objective is linear? Huh? Right, geometrically, but algebraically, what does it mean it's linear? It looks like uh, sum of coefficients times x1, x2, x3, right? So if I have in here x1 times x2, would that be linear? No. no. If I have x1 squared, would that be linear? If I have logarithm of x1, would that be linear? No. The only linear form is coefficient times x1 plus some coefficient times x2, like a linear equation or a dot product between coefficients and variables. Now what are the coefficients here? One and one, right? Sometimes we don't write the ones. But they are. This is a linear function, 1 times x1 plus 1 times x2. So the objective is linear. That's why it's called linear programs, because the objective is linear. You can't have in a linear program x1 squared. Also, the constraints are linear. See? All this stuff, it's a linear equation. The coefficients here are 4 and minus 1. This is 2 and 1. This is 5 and minus 2. Right? All of those are linear functions. And all of them being constraints are less or equal with something. I can easily make all constraints looking like bigger or equal than zero if I want. Because I can move this term in here. I can still have a linear function if I move the term in there. And if the inequality doesn't go in the way I want, I can multiply with minus one and change it to be positive all the time. Right? So I can get all the constraints quite easily to look like a linear function plus a free term, which is allowed in linear functions, right? Mm -hmm. It's always greater or equal than zero, or smaller or equal than zero, whatever. It's very easy to change a linear to, to look in that sense, right? So th this is quite a lot of problems that look that way. You did not think like shortest paths or maximum flows or optimization in a warehouse or airplane ticketing, or you know, all kinds of problems that can be written as an optimization. I want the maximum x1 plus x2 that satisfies this constraint. Now, this is the easiest constraint optimization problem because the linear functions are the easiest. As soon as you complicate the constraints or the objective, that's not linear programming anymore. Okay. So, how do we solve linear programs? We're gonna need that trick with the polyedra and walk on the vertices, but we have to set it up first that way. So first we're going to look at the constraint. Here's a constraint, 2x1 plus x2 smaller than 10. Because this is a linear function, we said all constraints are linear, this splits the entire space with a line into two sides. One side that says satisfying the, that constraint. That's the green side. Everything in here, if this is x1 and this is x2, any point in here satisfies small or equal than. The other side does. So if you pick any point here, this x1 and this x2, then 2x1 plus x2 will be bigger than that. What's up with the points on the line? If I pick an x1, x2 such that the point is on the line, what's going to happen to 2x1 plus x2? It will be exactly equal to 10. So the line is defined by the points that have exactly equal 10. This one side will be the ones that are smaller, 
the other one being the side that's high. Since the inequalities include equality for me, would the, would the line be included in the satisfied part or in the unsatisfied part? Satisfied. If I have strict inequalities, the line itself would be included in the unsatisfied part because the line again are the pairs that sum up exactly the 10. Everybody saw this thing in second, seventh grade geometry, right? Lines. Nice. But the important stuff here for us. It's the fact that there is this part of the of the half of the exactly half of the space by cutting the line it's the satisfied and the other half is non satisfied. And I really want you to think of this line as the cut. Like I, I, I wanna think physically as a knife who takes this whole space and cuts a piece and says, okay, remove this part out of your space because it, this is not satisfying the constraint. So I want to encourage here a, a physical model that I really have some sort of sore cut that says, here's my big space, 3D, 5D, 6D. And what the constraint does, it takes, cuts the line and say, that part of the space is no good because everything in that side violates these constraints. Make sense? So I want to think of this like I thought on this uh, polyhedras. Remember when I say cut the corner? I took a knife and I cut that corner. That's the same way I want to think here. When I say here's the line, cut it and remove that part. Okay? What happens if I take the cut multiple times? So I'm looking at this, 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 um, these constraints here are several constraints. So first of all, I cut it once for x1 being positive. That means I remove that side. That side corresponds to x1 being negative. So I cut it, gone. Then I cut x2 being positive because I, I cut it here and I remove the bottom because that's x2 negative. Then I look at this line, right? That's a constraint. It says blah, 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 blah. The, the arrow tells me which side is good. So when I cut this, what happened? The left side, it's out. Then I look at this constraint that says the side is good. So if I cut it here, now this part is gone, that part was gone. This line, it's also saying, you know, that's good. The arrow indicates which one is good. So I'm cutting it here. In my drawing on the slide, this is the, the gray region. So what, what this is saying, after you cut all these pieces that violate constraints, you end up only with this region here. Because every cut removes the part that's not allowed, right? This one removes that part, that part, that part, this part is gone, that part is gone. So what's remaining here after I cut all these parts, it's remaining this stuff. Now, you can easily prove, but I'm not looking for a proof, that this stuff remaining is the kind of polyhedra we discussed before, right? If I took the whole space, I'm not talking now about a wall or, 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 a, or an object. I took the whole 3D space, and I run these cuts. Cut here, remove that part. Cut here, remove that part. Cut here, remove that part. Keep doing cuts. What's gonna be left? What's going to be left is going to have sharp faces, sharp edges, and crisp vertices. Is it possible that it's open in one end, like this object here, it's closed on all sides? Is it possible that if I do, say, three cuts, to be completely open in one end, that I go to kind of infinity in that direction? I'm asking possible in a theoretical sense. So is it possible? to do a cut and do another cut and do another cut and now the remaining stuff it's kind of open that way that's possible so I may not always have a closed tetrahedra or polyhedra <coughs> but in some phases at least will be closed it may be closed like in here if I cut enough sides this becomes a closed object but that's okay what I really want to say is that this is the kind of objects we discussed before. The polyhedra that has clean cuts, 
clean edges and sharp vertices. And it may be open in one direction. Maybe in one direction doesn't have a cap at all. How many people will meet so far? Good. So now that we looked at the constraints, this is this is saying uh, th we didn't talk about the objective yet. We only said the constraints limit the solution or the points you're looking in the variable x1, x2, x3 to be inside this region, right? Because everywhere else, some, it violates some constraint. So now let's look at the objective. Uh, we take that objective, x1 plus x2. I have the feasible region from before because I cut it, right? I cut the constraints out. Everything outside this, 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 this closed form, it's not valid independent of the objective. The objective says do the best you can there, but even without looking at the objective, I know the, the, look, the x1, x2, x3 I'm looking for are gonna be inside this region. Now the objective, it's really x1 plus x2, right? That was my objective function. So what I'm gonna do to look geometrically at this objective, I'm gonna say, look, x1 plus x2, has different levels. Like, here's a line where x1 plus x2 is equal to 8. Anywhere on those lines, x1 plus x2 is equal to 8. So I'm ignoring a little bit the, 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 the feasible region here, the ones that's left out of the cuts. Anybody can see that x1 plus x2 equal 8, I pick it at random here. That, that's going to be a line, right? And it looks this way. What happens in this side? x1 plus x2 will be? Bigger than 8, and on this side, smaller than 8. Right? But I need more than that. I need to say, okay, this is the line with 8, the line with 6 will be somewhere here, the line with 4, right? The line with 0 is going to be here. Everyone on this line, they're going to be a 0. So this is really looking like decreasing that way uniformly because it's a line, right? Everywhere you go in this direction is going to decrease, and everywhere you go in that direction is going to increase. What I'm looking to here is to define that height function. Height maximize the objective or minimize the objective. So I say the height function has got to be perpendicular to these lines. Right? If, I, if I draw perpendicular, that's clearly <coughs> going to say in that direction, objective always increases. And in this direction, objective always decreases. That's independent to the actual cuts from the constraints. Like, I'm, I'm trying to ignore this. These lines will be x1 plus x2 equal 8 it's here, independent of the, the constraints, right? So what I'm saying is my objective is the line perpendicular to this. Now, because those are lines, x1 plus x2, these lines have to be parallel, right? Why? Why can't these line, two lines intersect? This x1 plus x2 equal 8 x1 plus x2 equal 4 lines. Can they intersect? Huh? They have the same slope, but why? Why? Huh? Somebody, hands up. Why these two lines cannot intersect? Or planes in 3D, those would be planes, right? Why? Same LHS lines have two different RHS. What? Same LHS lines have two different RHS at the same point. So basically, x1 plus x2 will be the LHS, right? So at the same point, there can't be two different RHS. Right, so if they, he's saying if they intersect, in the intersection point, x1 plus x2 will be 8, and x1 plus x2 will be 4, which is not possible. So they cannot intersect, they're all parallel, which means there is a common perpendicular line that says that direction always increases. I could have drawn the perpendicular line here, and that direction always decreases. Now this is my objective, so I want to, what does the problem says, maximize it. Which means geometrically go as far as you can in that direction. That will be my height direction. Now if you really want to see the height perpendicular to the floor, I can rotate this whole thing and put the red line perpendicular to the floor if you want to have a physical height. Height could be in any direction because I can always take the object and rotate it and end up with a line perpendicular to the gravity or something. So that's not a problem. I can define the height in any direction. Height is unidimensional. Again, it's one line. 
So now that I have constraints, I'm looking at my, my object here. I'm saying what I want to do really is to remain, I have to remain inside this region. Right? Everywhere outside this region is invalid. That's already decided from the constraints, right? I want to remain inside this region. And I want to go as far as possible in that direction. Right? Um, you can think of, uh, for example, if you have a bubble of water in, in, a, in a close uh, region or object or box, and you put it into the water, right? The bubble of, the bubble of air, sorry, the bubble of air will always try to raise up. And if your form, if, if my form, this is up, this is the direction goes up, right? And now I say, put this under water, where is the bubble gonna go? It's gonna try to go as far as possible in that direction, <coughs> right? It doesn't matter where it goes. So assuming, you know, or anywhere on this line, it's equal height. So if I'm in here or here or here or here or here or here, that's all equal seven. To increase, I need to go more in this direction. But remember, I have to be limited to my constraints. Like this bubble of air is constrained not to get out of this box. So where is it going to go in this example? It's going to go in this corner here. This is the farthest in that direction that's still in the box. And because we have less or equal to one inequalities, it means the lines are, the actual edges, are valid or invalid, valid, right? So I could actually get exactly in that point, right? Because that's gonna be a valid point since my inequalities have allowed equality, right? So this is the second critical point of this whole model. The first one was the convexity in the polyedra. If I cut it nice with cuts, I get those nice faces and edges. The second point is, once I have my polyedra here, that's a 2D, but I can have it 3D or 4D or 6D. And a direction, that's a one unidimensional direction that says go that way. The maximum that's being achieved, constrained by this, but as far as possible in that direction, theorem always going to be a vertex. The maximum will not be outside the vertex. It will always be in a vertex. So back to that soccer ball with pentagons and hexagons assuming they're flat. Imagine I have a ceiling that's a maximum, right? And I'm trying to fit the ball like, like maximum. I'm not trying to rotate the ball. I'm just trying to raise it up. What's going to hit first the ceiling? A vertex. I mean, I could have a, a very special case when I have an edge or a face that hits perfectly, like a line through the, the, the ceiling. But then all vertices on that edge or face will be equal. So I'm not saying only vertices have the max. I'm saying some vertex has the max, it may be more than one. If there's two vertices have the max, the, the edge between them will also be at the max. Right. Why do you think when people put covers on their laptops or phones or whatever they try to protect, you know, like objects that can break, they put a lot of stuff at the corners. You see those forms when the package comes? You notice the foam at the corners and a big nice monitor or TV? Where is the foam? at the corners. Why do you think it's in the corners? Right? When people package stuff and it's fragile, it might break. You <coughs> see the, the nice corners set up in the box? Why do you think that is? It falls Be because if it falls down, it's going to hit first the corner. the corner. Why the bumpers for the phones are really good at the corners and say in the middle doesn't really matter. Because the phone, I mean, it's true that the phone is a little flat, but it's still a, a, an object that has faces and corners. If you drop it, what's going to hit first? The corner. Assuming it drops on a flat surface. Now, what if it drops on an edgy surface? Right? I have some sort of spike, right? And I drop something on there. Is it guaranteed to fall on a corner? No. 
But in terms of a flat surface that has, that's my height, that's a flat surface. If I'm trying to push or drop something in that direction, anything I have that has faces and corners and edges, it's going to reach that flat surface first with a corner. You guys believe me here? I think it's better to follow the physical intuition of objects dropping down the floor, flat surface, to understand that well. And then once we get through it, you can come back to mathematical proofs. These are not hard proofs. It's quite easy to show that any object that, that's convex and has hard edges and, and faces or polyhedras. If it doesn't break this line, but it touches this line, like it's, it's in contact with it, that contact must be a vertex. Or it has to include a vertex. It can't touch with the interior point or a face or an edge without touching with a corner or without breaking on the other side completely. Okay. So I think the intuition of those things is really easy if you, if you, if you understand 3D geometry a little bit. But then some of the proofs are not that easy. So what's my plan here? Remember, I have to solve an actual system of equations. I'm going to take these constraints, create a polyhedra. Look at the height function that says increase the height, maximize the objective, or minimize if I want to go the other way. That's going to be a one line perpendicular to the objective waves or the objective levels. It's perpendicular because the objective is linear, so that's a function, that's a plan. Right? And then I'm going to do what I said earlier on the board, walk on that polyhedra, always increasing my height up to where I am guaranteed to reach that vertex that has the maximum height. And if I cannot go anywhere higher, I'm concluding I'm at the top right now. That's the simplex algorithm. So how are we going to solve this? Here's a bunch of constraints, right? Those are the constraints from there. Are they all of them? So I have 1, x2 positive, x1 positive. Uh, 2x2 smaller than 12, there's that one in there. x1 smaller than uh, 4. Uh, 3x1 plus 2x2 smaller than, than 18. 18, I don't, yeah, 18. So now the feasible region is this one in here, right? That's creating my polyhedra. I cut the sides that are no good, and I'm living with a nice convex object with flat faces, sharp edges. No round, no concavities, nothing like that, the polyhedra. And then I'm looking at the objective, 3x1 plus 5x2. Those are certainly, I have to look for the, here's the directions of that objective. This is when it's 76, 25, 15, 0. That's all the levels. That says, in any one of these lines, the objective is constant. It's going to be higher if you go that way, smaller if you go that way. So the direction, the high direction that I need to go into to increase the objective is perpendicular on those lines. The more I go in that direction, anywhere, it doesn't matter if I'm here or here or here or here. If I advance in that direction, geometrically speaking, if my projection to, to the line moves to this direction, right? From here, my projection will be here. And from here, my projection will be here. As long as this projection gets into the direction of the height, the increase in the objective, means I may progress. But of course, I'm limited to the polyhedra, I can get out of this polyhedra because out means violating some constraint. So like before, it's going to be a corner that has the maximum objective, but it's still inside the feasible polyhedra. That's how it's called feasible region, is that polyhedra after cutting all the corners. So that, I think, is this point right here. <coughs> that is the maximum I can go in that direction, but still inside or at the edges of my physical region. Right, now uh, a quick comment. This polyhedra might be empty if you cut too much, right? So we said there's a possibility of being open. That will matter only if the objective goes that way, right? If, if the objective goes that way, 
it's important that's open because it means it can go as far as possible in the objective direction. It's essentially unbounded. You can get, if that's your height function, you can get as high as you want because the, the, the region, the, the polyedra won't stop you. But it won't matter if the objective goes this way. Right? If the objective goes this way, or say this, this way, what happens if the objective goes this way? By the way, this is the objective function. And my polyedra is open that way. Can I go infinitely high in this polyedra? Yeah, I can, because this line goes up. It will allow me to go higher in that direction. Remember, the direction doesn't matter if I put it here or here. It just goes in that direction. What happens if my, so this is still unbounded. But what happens if my objective tells me go uh, this way? Now, in that way, it's bounded. It's not unbounded. It's unbounded the other way, but it doesn't matter for me because I'm trying to go this way. So where's the solution going to be, or the point I'm looking for? It's going to be a vertex right here. That's a maximum in this poly, in this constraint space that I can go that way. Right. Also, what I want to point out is that I may have a cut here that says all this part is invalid. Any line could be a cut. So if I cut this side, I'm left with what? No feasible region. That says, you know, your constraints, the way they cut, if you cut all the corners given these constraints, you're left with nothing. Like even before we compute the objective, like that, that's independent of the objective. Even if I don't have an objective, if I really have these this lines that says, this one says this is the feasible region, this is a, this is the feasible region, this is a, this is the feasible region. And this line says this is the feasible region. Then if I cut for each line the half of the space that's no good, I'm left to the intersection that's nothing. And then I don't have to look at the objective. I can tell right there, there is no x1, x2, x3 that satisfies those constraints, independent of where you're trying to go. So that's possible. OK? So that's what we want. This is the soccer ball triangles, or you know, here we see a triangle, but I could have a, a pentagon or a hexagon. And this is saying I have a height function that's a line in some direction that I'm trying to maximize. And I have my region, that's the intersection left after I cut all the parts. So I don't have to worry about constraints. As long as I'm in this ball or at the edges or vertices of this ball, I'm good. Question is, how do we get to the maximum top of the ball? And the algorithm says you don't have to work very hard. This is the height, say, as an example. This Z is at the H from the board. Right? Uh, this one says uh, it's quite easy. You look at some possibilities. Uh, for You are somewhere. You literally have a physical model where you as an agent are on some vertex. So you're always going to be in a vertex on this ball. And you say, where can I go from this vertex? I have six possibilities. And it's quite easy, if you think of algebra, to know from this vertex where else can I go. Every vertex is a linear combination <coughs> coefficient. And one of the coefficients will be 1 for that vertex. And I could easily tell what are my immediate neighbors on this guy by just playing with the algebra there. So if I evaluate my neighbors and I have their heights, uh, how do I compute the height, by the way? If I have this point, I want to know its height. What do I do? I compute the objective, right? If my objective is 3x1 plus 5x2, if somebody gives me a point, what do I do to get its height? I compute 3x1 plus 5x2 and see what I get. That's my height, right? It's easy. So if I have these options, I could tell on what height I have here, height 13. It's easy to evaluate. If I go to that neighbor, I get 20, 23, 19, 7, 3, and 10, right? Which one should I pick? Go to 23. In fact, what we just said is that anywhere you go higher, eventually you're going to reach the top. 
But in a greedy fashion, perhaps if you go as high as possible, you will have less steps to go. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. It's not guaranteed, right? It's not guaranteed that if I pick the, the next highest to be the actually shortest path to the top. That's not a guarantee. But in practice, if I go as high as possible, it, I have less work to do to get to the top, right? So how would this work if I start here, for example? Where should I go? 19. Suppose I don't go to 19. I think this example goes to 14. Higher. The, 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 the critical part is to always go higher. For 14, say I go to 18. From 18, I go to, say, 28. And now, if I want to go higher, it's a 36. So there's always a path on a convex <coughs> polyedra to go to the top. Even if I go lower, which I'm not, I don't want to do, I still have a path to the top. Right? But if I go low and how low and how low, low, low and high, I may not finish. If I go always higher, am I guaranteed to finish? Yes, because it's a finite number of vertices there, right? 300,000 vertices, I don't know. There's only that many height values. If you always go higher, 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 there's only at most 300,000 steps that you can take until you reach the top, right? So that's guaranteed it's gonna reach there. And this is guaranteed to be a solution because it's the point that has the maximum objective, the vertex. And I know that the solution will definitely be in a vertex, right? The objective, what I, what I did geometrically before, was guaranteeing that the point you're looking for, it's got to be one of the vertices. So if this vertex has nowhere else to get higher, it means there's no other vertex higher than it. And since I know I'm looking for a vertex, not for an interior point, this got to be the solution. Now, I know how that's not mathematical, OK? And I, I'm doing that to follow an intuition here, for, especially for people who have not seen synthesis, who have not seen linear system of equations, because not everybody does the same math in their high school. Uh, but even if you've seen it, you might have seen system of linear equations, but not a simplex algorithm, not formulated as a linear program. So that's easy, right? The intuition of the thing is quite easy. But then, how does this actually happen? Uh, short of but some examples here, you can formulate a lot of problems as linear programs and then solve them with this simplex algorithm, find the vertex that's maximizing the objective, still part of the region. That's going to give answers to maximum flow, short of path, so on and so forth. But it's not always the most efficient method in terms of an algorithm. <coughs> so even though you can solve short of paths with it, Dijkstra might be faster. So now, how do we actually solve this thing? Like, OK, we have a plan, an intuition, find that vertex that has the highest height. And we know that once I'm in a vertex, I want to go to a higher vertex. But what does that mean procedurally? So here's the system. Uh, first, we need to transform this system into a standard system. So uh, look at this, what I had initially, that's the kind of constraints and objectives that one might have, right? I'm going to transform it into a system that says uh, the objective is the same, but I'm transforming these constraints to be equalities. So I'm inventing new variables. Initially, my system has only x1, x2, and x3. And this constraint here was saying uh, minus x1, minus x2, plus x3 has to be uh, smaller than 7. Instead, I'm rewriting that as move 7 to the other side, make it an equality, say that whole thing is x4. That's a new variable. I'm creating that variable. And put a condition x4 has to be positive or negative. Positive. So I'm, I'm transforming my inequality into an equality with a new variable. And instead of saying this whole thing has to be bigger than minus 7, I move the seven on the other side. Now I say this whole thing has to be bigger than zero, but I don't put inequality. I call it x4, and then I say x4 has to be bigger than zero. So now, in this transformation, which is very easy to do, even with a program, right? What happened, I move the three terms on the other side. I don't call them inequalities. I call them equalities, new variables. And I put a constraint as new variables have to be positive. 
And also, I put a constraint on the original variables have to be positive. So where is x1, x2 coming on to be positive, the original ones? That's a constraint I have here. And I can move any system into that sort of the constraint. I will skip the details. If it's a good exercise in this class to try to implement for yourself the simplex algorithm to play with it. You won't get an efficient implementation uh, for reasons I'm going to talk a little bit later. But it's useful for you to see how this stuff works. Don't use no MATLAB or linear algebra. Try to do it by yourself with you know, Python or something. So if you have time, uh, people who want to do this typically do it after the class is over because there is really no time right now to do this. But that would be a useful exercise to implement this simplex for yourself. So that's what I want to get. I'm going to call the basic variables the ones that were given to me, x1, x2, x3. And the non-basic, the one that I invented, x4, x5, and x6. So how do I move from one vertex to the next vertex, right? Because I, I, that's easy to say and put a picture on the board, say from here, move here, right? But well, okay, a computer doesn't see the 3D object, it needs numbers, right? So how do I do that? Uh, what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'm showing you a simple pivotal procedure. There's many ways to do this, but here's one. It says um, pick one, one um, of the basic variables, x1 in here, that has a positive coefficient. So I pick um, So suppose I'm already in a vertex on this polyhedra. So I have, I have what, what does it mean I'm in a vertex? It means I have some values for x1, x2, and x3. That's not the solution, but corresponds to a valid vertex in my polyhedra, right? a valid solution. So then I say I want to move from this vertex to the next vertex. I'm picking x1, and I'm trying to increase the objective, right? I'm Simulating the physical model where I'm in a vertex, I'm trying to go up in the direction of the objective, so increase the objective. Now, since x1 I pick it with positive coefficient, what do I have to do with x1 to increase the objective? Increase, right? It has a positive coefficient, so if I increase x1, the objective is going to increase. So I try to do that, I try to increase x1. The problem is, at some point, if I keep increasing, one of these constraints is going to break. It's going to say, wait a minute, you're going too far. Right? So I, I, as I increase x1, I evaluate which constraint is going to break. So how far can I increase x1 here before this one has to be positive before this one breaks? I'm ignoring this other stuff. How much can I make x1? 30. In here? 20. In here? 90. Nine. So now I started in a position in this case with zero, zero, zero. So everybody's zero. That's why I'm saying ignore. You don't really ignore. It's zero because I'm in the point zero, zero, zero right now. So the values I have are zero, zero, and zero. And I'm saying keeping the x2, x3 fixed, how much can I increase x1? Which constraint is going to break first? This one, right? Because this one allows me to only increase to nine. So I take this one, and I rewrite that constraint as, you know, I can rewrite it not as x6 equals something. I rewrite it as x1 equals something. So I rewrite it this way. This and this are the same thing. What happened, I move the 4x1 on the other side, the x6 on this side, and then I divide it by 4. Right? Everybody sees this? If I move this x 4x1 in here, and the x6 in here, and I divide by 4, I get x1 equal, where's the 9 coming from? So this is by 4. Where is x3 by 2? There were two x3s, and I divided by 4, so I get x3 by 2. This is the same as that. But it's important that it's the one that break first. It says if you want to increase x1 to increase the objective, this is the constraint that's going to limit you the most. In fact, the other two don't matter at this point because you're going to get stuck with this one first. 
and it only matters. But you can't you can violate the constraint, so if only let you go to nine, then that's what it is. So if I want to do this increase x1, what do I have to do? Make it nine, right? So now I'm rewriting everything based on this formula of x1. So here's what I'm going to get. This is the same system, but written with recomputing everything in terms of this x1. So x1 is the equation we computed. x4 is rewritten by, by, by changing x1. So what happened with x1? X1 is not in here anymore, right? So it's an X1 swapped with who? The basic variables now are who? X2, X3, X6. And the non-basic variables now are X1, X4, and X5. The reason I swap X1 with X6 is that if I want to increase X1, which I pick by picking something with a positive coefficient, I figured out is the x6 that's the limiting constraint. So I effectively swap them. And what happens to uh, now the x's coefficient in the objective? It's negative. So that's an interesting question, which I'm not going to answer. Why is that? But I'm going to move on and say, OK, what should I do now? Pick another variable in the objective that has a positive coefficient, for example x2 or x3, they have positive coefficients. That means if I increase those, the objective will increase. So now, suppose I do that. I pick x3. What am I going to do? Look for the constraint that's going to break first when I try to increase x3. How much can I increase x3 in here? 18, right? How much can I increase it here? Up to whatever this becomes 21, right? And how much can I increase it here? 6 by 4 or something until it gets 0, right? So I, I need to figure out which one is the tightest one. I think it's this one. Right. So I rewrite that equation in X3 just like before. And I do the calculations based on this one. So I get a new system that has now x6 negative coefficients. x3 has been swapped with who? x5. Now this is negative, this is negative. So the one that I have left with positive that I can increase it, it's x2. So by doing this, at some point my, my objective will have all negative coefficients. In that case, what's the solution? If if everything is negative, zero, zero, zero would be the solution, right? So when I get all negative coefficients, I set up those variables at that point that are in the objective as zero, and then I recompute x1, x2, x3. Those are the original variables that I need. So what's going to happen here? Eventually, either uh, I didn't start. So I'm assuming by didn't start, I couldn't find a way to put myself in a valid vertex, right? I have to be in one of the vertices. I, I could also be in the interior. If I'm in the interior, when I increase the first time, I may get to a vertex. But I have to get inside the, the cuts. If for some reason I can't get inside the cuts, either because there's nothing in there, or because I don't have a way to get in, I can't start the procedure. I have to start in a point that's valid. Uh, if I end up with all negative coefficients in the objective, then I have my solution. I set those to zero, and then I recompute everything else on those. That will be my solution to my system. What else can happen? Um, I try to increase x1. I pick one of the variables with a positive coefficient. I try to increase it. No constraint breaks. I notice that I can just keep going, increasing, and I don't have a constraint that breaks. At that point, I'm in these situations where I can go in that direction and nothing breaks. So it means the system is unbounded 
you can have solu valid solutions that are up to infinity in that sense. So that's what's called unbounded. Um, or I could uh, cycle back and forth. This is a really particular case. I don't want to put too much effort in this. Is it possible to just go around a bunch of vertices in that polyedra and kind of cycle and make no progress? It's kind of flat, and uh, I, I don't know which direction to go or something like this. Uh, in this case, there's a simple fix of the algorithm to avoid this part. Uh, what you should know um, so the, the, these fixings are easy, the necessary for implementation, they're easy. What you should know, the hardest part in all this is the initialization. It sounds easy once you have the cuts, pick some point in that polyedra and start from there. And we already know if you start in a valid position, eventually you're going to reach the top. But it's not easy to find something that's in the valid, independent of the objective. So, you know, it just has to be valid. That's not easy. The, the right way to do this, which I'm going to skip for now, but you should know it, it's a big deal, is to start an entire linear program just for that purpose. So there is some notes in here, and the book talks about it, that if you want to start in an initial vertex, so-called feasible, valid, configuration, you need to search an, an entire auxiliary, the whole problem, just to find that initial solution. So this has been typically an area of back and forth, not how to implement the simplex, but how to find an initial position. So if you write the simplex algorithm, I suspect you're going to spend more time dealing with making sure you can start if there is a polyhedral left, again, like you, you may have to cut, when you cut those corners, you're left with nothing. If you're left with nothing, there's no point, there's no way to start. But if there's left with something, finding a point so you can start the simplex, it's gonna take some effort. So this is something that when you implement it, that one. Now, about running time. Theoretically, simplex algorithm, it's exponential. So in the worst case, with examples put by hand, you say, okay, how many, how many uh, steps do I need to do to move from one vertex to the other to reach the top? That could be exponential in the number of vertices. That, that uh, n plus n choose m options, that's actually exponential in m. So in the, everything we talked about so far in this class, exponential algorithms are bad, right? takes two to the end running time, that's no good. That's theoretically, however, in practice, this is quite a usable algorithm. Very rarely, I'm gonna end up in that exponential sort of situation. In practice, even though the ball has many, many faces, I will go quite quickly among these vertices and end up to the top. So this is actually how problems are being solved. Even though theoretically we don't know a way to make the simplex, you know, poly polynomial time algorithm. Um, so I think that's it for the linear programs. What we need to remember from here? One thing is the the geometry, the part that I showed you on the board. You got to have that intuition before you sink into the linear algebra, because once you get into linear algebra, you can lose that intuition, what happens here. Secondly, while the procedural the algorithm is easy, in terms of you know move from one vertex to the other, it's only the inside of the algorithm is really what? Is really this, right? Pick a positive variable, positive coefficient variable. Solve for the constraint, that's extremely easy to do. Replace now x3 with this and rewrite the system and be done and do this so many times until you're done. That part is easy, but there's some details, especially about the initial solution that are complicated. Okay? 
I think it'd be quite a good exercise to try to implement this. Uh, and there's a homework about it. The other thing I want to talk about is something that um, is related, but much more complicated. That says, suppose I have the same sort of problem but I'm limiting my x1, x2, x3, and the, all the coefficients to be integers. So the, before, if you paid attention, all the values I had and the coefficients I have could have been any real numbers. Now I'm saying I'm adding the additional constraint. So it's still the same as before. This is a linear objective. This is a bunch of constraints which, uh, which are saying uh, x's have to be positive in a, in a standard form. But I have the additional constraint that says the values I'm looking for are integers. Is this an easier problem or a harder problem? This is definitely a harder problem. Because the, the basic trick that we did before with finding a positive coefficient and solve for the equation when you solve, even though the values you have are integers and the coefficient are integers, the actual how much can I increase x1 before it breaks, I may increase it to 3.7. And 3.7 is not valid. Now you could say, OK, if you get 3.7 from the linear program, just use 3. Right? Because the 3 is the last integer value that can be used. That doesn't work so well. So integer programs are much harder problems and people have struggled with them. Because in many problems, the input is indeed integers and restricted to be integers. For example, the discrete knapsack problem is <coughs> reformulated as an integer linear program. The one that picked the set of objects that maximize your value. You remember these values and weights had to be part of integers, so we run a nice computation table. Well we can write this as an integer linear program. Integer linear program is just a linear program where the variables are restricted to integers. So how can we do this? Obviously, the most straightforward way is to say, OK, can you solve the problem without the integer constraints that makes a linear program out of it? Right? Just take that problem treat it as a linear program, ignore this, get a solution, assuming we can run linear program with the simplest algorithm. And then once I get a solution, if that solution is integers, I'm done. Right? Are you guys with me? Hands up. So we, we where are we? Where we got lost? We got lost on the, on the linear programming? go back a little. Maybe I went too fast over this because I was assuming in high school we did enough linear algebra system of five equations with five unknowns type of thing, right? We remember those? No? Maybe. So you should have seen systems that have equalities here, not inequalities. And in some sense we did exactly that when we move it to the to this shape here. called the slack form, but it doesn't matter how it's called. In here, we have a system with equations, except we also have this constraint everybody has to be positive. So now, I'm assuming that up to here, it's all nice and easy. But in here, again, I, I think for now, if, if this is new to you, it's better to ignore the math and see, I'm trying to move from a vertex to another vertex. How do I achieve this? I'm picking a vertex that I can increase, meaning it has a positive coefficient, and I increase it until a constraint dies on me. And when it dies, it's that that's that's gonna be the tell me which vertex I need to go into. That's the next one. So I'm gonna rewrite the system in terms of that constraint. And eventually I'm gonna reach a system that has all the the basic variables with negative coefficients. At that point, the solution is 0, 0, 0. 
which means I can recompute everything based on it. That's an easy story that you have to absolutely get. The hard part is deal with initialization. How do you start in a valid purpose? So how many people are with me on that part? Okay. Good. So assuming we've got that, How do we apply this to solve problems that are the same formulation but with an additional constraint that the x's that we're trying to get are integers? So here's a plan. Solve the linear problem first without the integer constraint. If I get I get x's at the end, suppose I get unfeasible, like impossible. Can I conclude that my integer problem is impossible? Suppose I get unbounded, like there's always a way to get infinite solutions. Can I conclude that my integer problem is unbounded? Are you sure? So if it says unbounded in a linear program, that, that's this situation right here that says, if your objective goes that way, you can go as much as you want that way. There's no constraint in that direction. Okay, that happens for the linear program. Can I conclude that it's also true for the integer program? I can, with integers, go that way and keep maximizing my objective. I don't think that's necessarily true. It's true most of the time, but I can come up with an example where there is a feasible region that's very narrow in the direction of the objective that goes as much as possible, but does not contain any integer solutions in it try to find that example where it is unbounded in that direction, but it has no integer spots. So here's an example. I have this constraint, this constraint. That's not for the unbounded version. Two examples, and, and this is a exonomics tool. Now, if I solve it without the integer constraint, just solve the linear problem, maximize x plus y subject to this constraint, I get 4 and 4.5. That is, uh, x is 4 and y is 4.5. That's the maximum that will satisfy that. <coughs> of course, the problem is this is not an integer solution. 4.5 is not an integer. So can I just say, uh, OK, uh, then the solution looking for, 4 is good, right? It's an integer. It's a y, the second variable. It's written y here before was x1, x2, x3, but y is just a variable here. It's got to be either 4 or 5. Can I say that? So again, my linear programming tells me this is the maximum solution, and it is indeed. This is the one that maximizes the objective and satisfies those constraints. Like before, it has to be in a vertex, right? What is the minus 2x plus 2y for 4 and 4.5? What do we get if we plug it into the first one? one four and four point five. We get exactly one. So that's on the line. How about the second one? How much is eight times x? Thirty-two. Ten times four point five is how much? Forty-five. Forty-five minus thirty-two. That's also on the line. That's exactly the vertex, right? If it's on two lines, it's got to be exactly the vertex. So linear program did its job. It found the vertex that's as much as possible in the direction of the objective. But can I just say now, OK, I want a linear solution, an uh, integer solution. This is good, the 4. I'm going to try y equal 4 and y equal 5, because the 4 and 5 are the closest integer to 4.5. Does it make common sense intuitively to try that? Yeah. Definitely, right? So what happens if I plug in 4 and 4? Is this going to be satisfying? No. What happens if I plug in 4 and 5? How much is this one? Is it satisfying? So see what happens here? Even though intuitively I'm looking for an integer close to 4.5, because this was not an integer, 
either four or five violates one of the constraints. So that makes it at least interesting, to say the least, right? You can't just say, solve the linear problem and then try the integers nearby. Not good enough. So here's the actual situation. Those two constraints are quite close, but they're not parallel. <coughs> so they create a feasible region that's so narrow. Why am I plotting a lattice here? Because the integers are the, the, the spots on the lattice, right? The integers are. So what are the points in this, in this lattice that are integers and intersect the feasible region? Feasible region is the same like linear programs. It's just cutting the corners off or the spaces off until you left, but it's only this green stuff. So what are the points in this feasible region? Even though the solution to linear program is 4 and 4.5, when I try to put y equal 4 or 5, that's outside. But even earlier, there's a lot of integers that are simply not inside the green region. I have to go all the way down to 1 and 2 to be in the green region. So it's not as easy as start there and see you know, what's nearby. Nearby is nothing. That's good. Okay. So how do I solve this? I, we can't solve it completely today in class in 10 minutes, but I can give you an idea. Here's how we can solve it. We do what we just did. We got the 4 and 4.5. And now we say, which one is breaking? Oh, the, the y is breaking, right? Y was 4.5. So we look at the solutions we have, and we say, there's two options for y. Either y, 4.5 is no good, because it's not integer. So what are the possibilities? Either y it's at most 4, or y it's at least 5. Because in an integer space, if 4.5 is no good, it's either up to 4 or 5. So what we're going to do is to say we have our systems. We have an objective. So that's our problem. Problem. I'm going to call it P0 because this is the original problem. And we have some constraints. The objective in here was x1 plus x2, and the constraints were, let's follow this example. What were them? Minus eight, x, uh, eight x1 plus 10 x2, smaller than 13 and um, minus 2x1 plus 2x2 is greater than one. That's what we have. We solve it with linear programming. LP give us x1 equal 4, x2 equal 4.5. 4.5 is no good. Obviously, if this would be in teacher value, I'm done. I think that's clear, that if this comes out magically, coincidentally as integers, I'm good. And here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say, OK, I want to split into two problems. I want to say, in one problem, x2 would be at most 4. And in the other problem, x2 would be at least 1. Now, certainly, that includes all possibilities, because all integers are either up to 4 or at least 5. So I'm still putting here the objective and the rest of the constraints. I'm not ignoring those. But I'm adding a constraint. How did I pick 4 and 5? Because it came out as 4.5 in this linear program. So in here, I also have objectives and constraints. But I'm adding one more constraint, one additional constraint. This. So how is this going to help me? I'm splitting the problem into two problems now, so it's more work. right? I could have done that splitting on any value. Why split at 4.5? X 
why not split that, you know, 13.7? I could split all the time into integers, but of course splitting, remember the early, early version of course, if I keep splitting, what's gonna happen with the number of subproblems? It could become very big very quickly, right? So I wanna split, because I have to split, I have to solve partial problems, but I would like to split in a way that one of the subproblems it's easy. Easy meaning uh, it doesn't go splitting forever, right? The problem in those splitting subproblem trees is that they all go down and they all split, 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 split. That's an exponential growth subproblem that I have to solve and then I end up with essentially a brute force try everything. So I like to split in a way that one of the problems it's somehow easy, or at least doesn't split very far. I, I, it just takes a little bit to solve it. Why is it that if the objective is 4.5, if I pick those two problems, very likely one of them will die quickly? Let's think about what happened geometrically. The two problems says, additionally to the feasible region that you have, which is a nice convex polyedra like before. Remember that the feasible region is the same in integer programming as in linear programming. That's no difference. It's this thing here. One problem says, try y below 4. Not try. Constraint. You have to use. And the other one says, y has to be above 5. Now, because the objective was in a corner, right, 4.5, I say one of those creates an uh, empty feasible region. Not all the time, but very likely if this was a corner of the space in the direction of the which it was, linear programming will always produce a corner of the space, right? We know that. Then when you try in here, go to integers, this and that, very often, one of these problems will have a feasible region that's empty, like there's nothing valid, and that's done, right? I don't have to worry too much how to solve it because there's no solution in there. In this case, which is that feasible region? Which of the problems has no solutions? The five, right? This one saying try y bigger than five doesn't intersect to the feasible region. Therefore, that problem is not going to split forever into subproblems. So splitting at the vertex where the objective came, that y, creates this, even though it's an exponential split, and it's not guaranteed that one of the problem is dead. You could split in a way that actually splits the feasible region in two, and I still have two valid subproblems. That, that's possible. In practice, one of them will die quickly. And that's good for me, right? Because I'm only going to the one that makes sense. Now, of course, if I split at four, I have a constraint that says y has to be lower than 4. If I solve the linear problem, I'm going to get uh, the direction is that way, right? So it's going to be this corner right here now? Yes. Imagine if I, if I take this part out with a knife. Is this corner right here, is that an integer solution? No. no. I'll have to do the same, keep doing this. Like look at one of them, split into blah, blah, blah. So how does this work? Like for this particular problem. See, those are the constraints, that's the objective, right? I'm looking at 4 and 4.5, and I'm saying 4.5 no good. I'm going to create two subproblems. One that says y has to be smaller than 4, one that says y has to be at least 3.5. So let's try the one of 5 first. I'm adding this constraint here. So what's going to happen? This is going to die. It's going to say, there's no way to solve this. It's not related to linear program or integer programming, right? This is not about integer programming. It just says the feasible region, what's left after you cut all the constraints, is empty. That's part of the linear programming. If that's empty, you can't solve it linear or integer or no integer. It doesn't matter. There's nothing in it. So I can still call linear programming. I'm only calling linear programming here and say, that problem is dead. Then I try y equals 4. That's the other problem, right? With the constraint smaller than 4. And this one has a feasible region. So I solve it with linear programming. And I'm getting 3.5 and 4. That's no good, right? I take a 3.5. 
then I say now x has to be either <coughs> at most 3 or at least 4. So I keep that previous, because I'm still in that subproblem now. I added that constraint before, and I'm still trying to solve that problem. So I'm trying x bigger than 4. Again, it dies. That's good, because that whole branch of that subproblem tree is no, no interesting. And then uh, I get 3.7 for y here. That's not integer, so what happens here? I split this one in two based on? There's another trick here. If I split y again, which has already been decided smaller than four. Now, when I say smaller than three, I can ignore the constraint smaller than four, right? Smaller than three, I don't need to keep smaller than four. It won't bother me too much. I'm just making an observation. However, if I say bigger than three, that's going to be three or four, right? So if I keep doing this, eventually I get a solution. And I can prove this is the actual solution. That's easy to prove. How do I know this is the solution? All the other branches dead or solved. If I manage to solve two branches and they've got me integer solutions, both of them, I'll now have to check which one has the <laughs> maximum objective between them. I always, when I find a valid solution, I'll record the objective. The objective so far was blank. If I find a better one, fine. But my point in doing this branch and bound, how it's called, is that many of the branches will die relatively quickly, so the tree doesn't expand too much. Now, since then, people have, this is a valid implementation. You can write branch and bound on top of linear programming and get integer programming to work. But people since then have said, okay, there's a better way to do it. Instead of cutting at y, cutting four versus five, cut more intelligently in a place that says, look, your solution, it's on one side of the cut. It's just like splitting into y equal four and five, but it's y four and five was splitting right here. It says that's one problem, that's the other problem. This one's saying, I'm gonna cut intelligently. It's hard to find those cuts, but if I can. Saying the solution is in this side, and in this side there's no integer solutions. So that's guaranteed to be dead, the whole thing because there's no integer solutions there. The remaining side is the one you have to solve. So some guy, I think Gomori or something, figured out, okay, how to do those cuts. And that's a faster algorithm because it guarantees that problem dies immediately. And it also the cuts are more in the middle of the space, so the remaining problem is not that big. The problem with those cuts here is that the remaining problem could be still quite a lot of it. So if you follow these slides, <coughs> Gomori cuts rely on Lagrangian multipliers, it gets complicated. You could implement the branch and bound that I described very easily. The procedure I described, implementation will take nothing. Right. But you may have to solve a lot of sub problems in some cases to find the integer program. So that is for linear and integer programming. There is a homework about this. <laughs> And there will be more office hours. Uh, I don't know about today, but next week, I think, we'll have to have more office hours for several reasons. One is, uh, so I talk about trace evaluations. The other thing that's needed is for you guys to check that grades file. There is a way to go online. Anybody check the grades? Hands up. OK. Many people check the grades. That's a good system. It means it's working. If you can't see your grades, if you see a CCIS login page, you need to put your CCIS username because the CGI doesn't let you pass that gate. If you pass that gate but you don't see your grades, there's probably a typo in the grade sheet. Instead of your name being Virgil, it's type like something else, and then the script doesn't match. The TAs can easily fix that. Okay. So um, not all grading is done. The TAs are working on various problems with the grades. Um, if your grade is not in there yet, like homework, I don't know, seven or eight, they 
will finish it. Uh, that's okay. You should worry right now about the grades that are in, but you think they're not correct. Like homework three has been graded, you're missing a grade. Check out for the TAs, why am I missing this grade? You lost some points that you don't understand why. They should have written in your Dropbox folder on the file, there's a problem with it. But if you don't understand that, go to a TA. You have to figure out which one is the TA who graded that problem. Uh, but I need you guys to fix those issues between now and the end of the term because the grades are due on April 20, 30th, 30th on Monday. Now if you don't fix those problems by then, it's gonna be inaccurate grading, right? So we need to check those things out. And the other reason we're gonna need next week, I think, is the meters. People are gonna have a lot of questions about those meters because I still can't figure out some examples in problem six. If your algorithms work or not, um, I didn't have time to look at that fully. But this weekend, I think we have to. Uh, make sure we All right. Okay. Oh,